Here we are inside the locker room of the Troy Baseball Facility at Riddle Face Field. I'm Barry McKnight, Troy Baseball Coach Skyler Mead. How are things? Things are good. Excited to get going this week. Experience tells us that, uh, you know, live and breathe Troy Baseball, that late January, a lot of work getting done, a lot of busy times for this program, Coach. Yeah, absolutely. Although I thought it was going to keep being warm like it was in December. <laughs> it hadn't been there, so it's making us get a, get a little tougher as we get out there and get our work. But... Yeah, we'll uh, we start up the team stuff on on Friday the twenty eighth, and it's uh, it's full steam ahead, leading right into the season. Between now, say, and when you first got the job, what was important for you to begin to cast your stamp on this program? Well, you have to just be clear and direct with what your expectations are. You know, and a lot of people use the term culture, and obviously we do too, but. You just want guys to know what they're supposed to do on the days that we practice, the days that they have off, the, the time that is in between, the gaps, you know, the 50-day gap between the end of the fall and November to January. Like, just making those things clear, whether it be your baseball work, your what you do dietarily, what you do hydration-wise, what you do in the weight room, running. I mean, I could go down the list. And so I think our guys have done a tremendous job of understanding that and executing it. And there's things that certainly have to get better, but the buy-in has been on point. Between now, well, well, Friday, as you mentioned, the 28th, and the start of the season on February the 18th. It's not a lot of time, Coach. What's important then in an actual on-the-field baseball sense? I would say just uh, this is kind of a collective thing, but make simple things simple. You know, how, how we're playing catch, pitchers throwing strikes, hitters having, an, having a routine and approach to what they're doing. Um, you know, things like that. We need those things to be good. I mean, look, yeah, I want guys to make diving plays in the gap. Those things will inevitably happen. But I want us to be able to execute all the things that I think are controllable in the game of baseball. And if, if we do that, you give yourself the best chance to win immediately, but you also have the chance to win when it's really big boy ball in late May and into June. I remember reading one time an old, old-time catcher for the Orioles named Rick Dempsey was breaking down game pitch by pitch. You win that one pitch. You move on to the next pitch and next pitch, and then you, you look up, and it happens has gone by, and innings has gone by, the game's gone by, and you can break it down incrementally in that sense. And basically, if you win the pitch and move on to the next pitch, by and large, you're going to be successful. Does that make sense? It makes total sense. I mean, we, we talk about it on you know a, a smaller level. We try to win the day, you know, not get focused on February 18th or dates that guys get excited about, right? Like we're trying to win today. We're going to try to win January 24th, right? Mm -hmm. But from a, a pitcher standpoint, you know, you mentioned that pitch to pitch and play to play. Like that's only that is in that moment. That's the only thing you can control. Was my preparation to this pitch, and that could go for all nine guys in the field. Did the pitcher do his breathing routine, and was he committed to that pitch? Did the catcher set up properly? Did the infielders and outfielders time up their prep step? You know, if you do all of those things every single pitch and have the, the mental fortitude to do that over and over and over, over 140, 150 pitches in a game, I think you improve your chances more than you could ever imagine. Before we got on the air here, before the camera started rolling, I was looking and, and looking here and there's a lot of new names on a lot of these lockers so far, but there's a lot of familiar names. I'm looking at a few behind us right now. Those guys in a transition period into into your program or into your era here are critically important, I would imagine. Can, can you comment before, again, the baseball sense, before we really get into it January the 28th, um, how important those guys have been during this, um, during your first few months on the job? Oh, absolutely. I mean, if it's a guy like Rigsby or Marquez or Jesse Hall or Kurt, I mean, these are, and then there's more than just those guys I named there, but guys who have experienced success, you need those guys to be at the forefront of, of creating those expectations. And it's not to put a burden on those guys. I mean, that is, that's why we don't do captains, but we also know who you know, has earned their respect, earned their stripes. And, and you can do it in a multitude of ways. Right. Some guys do it by their on-field performance. Some guys do it by their daily work. Some guys do it as a combination, right? Mm -hmm. But those guys have been instrumental because you know, in practices, and I, I've told people this in some interviews I've done over the last couple of months, towards the end of the fall, there would be times where something would happen, and, you know, as a coach, you're going to go stand up and address it, and I would hear a player address it before, and then I could go just sit my butt down and not have to say anything, but that's how it's supposed to be. Coach Izzo, you know, during our Michigan State time together, he always said, player, 
coach-led teams are better than coach-led teams. I know I, as a coach, myself and our staff, we have to set the tone daily and expectations. But there are little things that if player to player can be handled, it, I think it means even more than if myself or Coach Wogamon or Coach Godwin were to say it. If a player tells you something's not up to snuff, I think it means a lot. When we mention some of the names of some of the players, and you talk about Rigsby Mosley, a guy whose name resonates among Troy fans because he's been here for that long and has been productive for that long. On the field, I know there's bound to be some expectations for him as, as somebody who's familiar with the way things are done around here. Getting him back for another year was a win for this program. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I remember it was something that was going on with him and his grad school. You know, like that was my first week on the job here. And so I, it was funny as you're doing it. I'm looking at it initially just because I don't know people I, from a baseball standpoint. Hey, he's a good player. Like, let's get. But then you start realizing how everyone has a high level of respect for him. And you realize, aside from the baseball part, he's a very unique kid. And, and we have a lot of those. And that's what's been great for me as we go around this locker room. There's no bad, there's no bad dudes. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. they, there's all things they could all mature on in their life, just like myself and, and all of my staff. We can all get better at certain things, but they're all good people. They have a lot of respect in the community, a lot of respect around this, this league. And so, you know, a guy like Rigsby, you're, you're pumped that we have the ability to coach him for one year. With your definition of success, when this team is successful, what will they look like? What do you want to see your successful team look like? I could give you a long answer to that. I won't give you something too long-winded, but we're going to play incredibly hard. Uh, you know, our values here in the locker room, I mean, attitude, toughness, discipline. I, I want people to see those things exuded in how we play. So, you know, I want our guys, when they come to the ballpark every day, smiling, having a positive attitude. I think if you create that positive attitude, especially in the sport of baseball, mm -hmm. you create the ability for success. You know, I mean, I want our guys to show a lot of mental toughness. I, I want us to be a team that plays all 27 outs. Guess what? There's going to be games where you're down in the eighth or ninth, and you got to have the toughness to stay within your approach and handle a moment. You know, it's it's five to four, you're down, and the bases are loaded, and you know this guy's going to throw you slaughter after slaughter after slaughter. If you're a right-handed hitter, can you be tough enough mentally to go, I'm bought into my approach here, and I'm going to smoke the ball right over the second baseman's head and win the game? Not try to be a hero right. and pull it to left and hit it out because the wind's blowing out, but to take what they give you and win. And then just to be disciplined enough to do to do little things. You know, If you're a guy who's struggling and you get a 3-1 count, not swinging at a ball out of the zone. Uh, you know, If you're a pitcher that you know, you're in there in a big moment, can you still throw a bad pitch, reset, take your breath, and then go back and commit to that very same pitch the next one? To me, that's what success is going to look like. I'm not going to put a number of what that means for wins. I just want our team to max out what we can be and, and what we can be potentially. And we feel strongly, and we'll see it more as we get into team practice, but I think we have a lot of the attributes needed to be a very productive baseball team this year. One of the famous quotes about the sport is that you cannot play this game with your teeth clenched. So I'm glad when you bring up new toughness, you're not talking about grinding the bat uh, until the you know until the, the handle comes off or gritting your teeth or anything like that. You're talking about mental toughness in your approach and consistency. Abs oh, absolutely. This is look. I love football. I love basketball and all that. But but guess what? It, it, we always equate it to music, okay? Because we play you know kind of a certain style of music. There's a certain cadence to what we do in practice. And sometimes right. our players go, oh, that's I, they, I like that they're playing Drake or they're playing. Justin Timberlake, there's actually a rhyme and reason to what we do. I want them to be in certain mindsets. There's other times where the music has to create the energy, but you can't play this game like a psychopath. Right. You can't do it. As If I'm a linebacker in football and I want to listen to music like a maniac and then I run full speed to put my you know chin right in a running back's chest, that may help me actually. In baseball, you can't play this game like that. Whether you're a pitcher or a position player, you have to have a, a steadiness and ability to stop, start, reset. You just can't do it like a psycho because there's too much downtime. Since you bring that up, I wanted to bring this up as well to kind of corollary that um, the approach. One of the great things that I love about the Troy Baseball Twitter account is uh, what, they, what you call Whammy Wednesday. Yeah. I love watching that. A lot of analytics to go along with video that you post about Golly, not only about miles per hour, but spin rate and angle and, and things like that. 
analytics has become a real hot button topic in baseball as a whole, uh, professional, amateur, all that type of thing. You use analytics unashamedly as a, as a foundation of instruction for these players. Tell us how. Absolutely. Well, there's certainly a lot of ways it, it can be done. And one thing that we've always tried to do, and I'm, I'm just kind of stealing this from South Carolina, because you know when Coach Kingston and, and us all started there, we had just gotten TrackMan. So it was very new in 2018. Mm -hmm. And one thing we did great in our program, and I wanted to bring over here, was have all of this information, but don't bog the guy's minds down with it. Use it as a tool to show the improvements or to show things that maybe you do well and you don't even appreciate or realize, you know, and you talk about whammy Wednesdays and one of the things we've told our pitchers, look, we're not going to be a team right now where everyone's throwing 96. So what do we have to do? We have to have tremendous off speed. Obviously breaking balls are a large part of that as our changeups, of course, but we want our guys to understand, improve your breaking ball, create better intent with your breaking ball, tinker your uh, grip perhaps. And so we've done it as a way to help improve the guys mentally on um, it's funny, uh, Coach McCauley on our staff had had a, a conversation with a, a pitcher in the big leagues, mm -hmm. okay? And this guy, I won't say the amount of money he spent, but he spent a, a pretty strong amount of money to, uh, to kind of work on his game. And one of the things he really struggled with was breaking ball. And he paid all this money for a guy, and the guy told him, hey, you know what you should do? You should just rename your breaking ball to something, just some random adjective to feel good about it. And the guy had jokingly said, why don't you just call your breaking ball a whammer? And that's not where I got it. We had already put this on our program, right. but I found it to be hilarious because in the end, you're just playing mind games a little bit. But if our guys believe it and they actually go out and execute it as they really did in the fall, it makes me feel, that's where you feel buy-in. You ask the question, how do you feel buy-in? Right. We, we tried to create that culturally, and then the players went out and executed and have done a better job of that as time's gone on. Scott Mead, head coach of the Troy Trojans baseball team. February 18th is the season opener at Riddle Base Field against Holy Cross. Season tickets are available. Go to troytrojans.com slash tickets or 1-877-878-WINS. Thank you for joining us here from the Troy locker room. For Coach Scott Mead, I'm Barry McKnight.